All right, welcome to week six of our CEU on Gideon. I hope in some way there's been been uh, some takeaways for you that have been helpful during this during this season. Uh, again, I come to you live from my living room uh, because we're not able to be on campus together. But I'm so thankful that our admin sees the value in these times together and uh, that Jeremy has afforded us this opportunity just to continue in these in these devos. So we're picking up uh, in chapter number seven of, of Gideon. And uh, if you remember uh, last week, we, we got to that point where the Midianites had had attacked once again, and not only had they attacked, but they brought friends with them. Right, so um, there was not just there was not just the usual, but there was like overwhelming odds against against Gideon and the Israelites, and creating sort of a tense filled situation for Gideon, uh, who thought he had put his trust in God, but now maybe second guessing uh, what is what is going on here. And uh, if you remember, um, we talked about how uh, God asked him to get rid of some troops. And we're going we're gonna to read that part of the story today and then break it down a little together. So let's just read verses 1 through 8 and uh, then unpack it together. So early in the morning, Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, if you remember, uh, we'll let him contend with Bel is basically the name that they, they gave him. Um, and all his man, men camped at the spring of Harad. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. And the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I, I mean, again, let's just get our minds around that. If you're going to battle one of the greatest strengths in battle, is having the numeric advantage in terms of your your people or your artillery. Uh, Gideon, God said, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me and say, my own strength has saved me. So announce to the army that anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. All right, so, so here we have Gideon went from uh, just a few men. He makes the call. 32,000 men is now dwindled down to just 10,000 men. Uh, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men, Gideon. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Uh, so in, in other words, if someone just reaches their head down, they're out, Gideon. But if they scoop it up and they ladle the water in, they can stay. So 300 of them drank from cupped hands, uh, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpet of the others. So, so here we have it. God whittled this army down. Um, he, he, he had men who, Gideon had men who were ready to fight, 32,000 of them, but God had other plans. Uh, in fact, God said it in, in verse two, you have too many men. Um, and we know here what God was trying to do because he said it. I don't want you to win this battle and then say you did it in your own power. 
even though there were still incredible odds and they were still outmatched in numbers, uh, 300 is a lot less people than 32,000. And there is no way that 300 could say we took on a battle of an army of this size and one in our own power. Here's what we need to know. Ever since the Garden of Eden, man has been striving for this idea of independence and self-sufficiency. We want to we want to believe that we can do life independent of God, that we are self-sufficient within ourselves and don't really need him. We see this in the story of Adam and Eve. Um, we see it in the in the days of Noah, right? When God destroyed the, the world with water uh, because man had grown wicked and, and did not see their need for God. We see it in the story of Abraham uh, when God made Abraham a promise, but Abraham did not trust God, so he took matters into his own hands. Um, we see it in the life of Moses. Uh, after Moses and the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, almost immediately the people were complaining and saying that the God who brought us this far is no longer strong enough to provide us food to eat out here or shelter. Uh, maybe we should just turn our back on him at this, at this point. Man has proven over and over again that this search for independence or self-sufficiency just does not work. I mean, you've been there in your life. I've been there in mine. Every attempt, to, to have some kind of independence from God, to have self-sufficiency from God. It always comes up short and it never works. So what do we do when we find ourselves in a place like Gideon was, where um, he, I, I'm sure he wanted to push against this idea that God was presenting to him, but nevertheless, God was saying, hey, I want to show you that I can fight this better battle better than you. I, I think what we have to do is we have to condition our heart to say in moments like this, we are not going to panic. We are not going to panic when God gives us a test. All right. And this is exactly what God was doing to Gideon. He was not going to panic. Um, God, God, in fact, gives Gideon two different test to sort of cut the numbers down, uh, first by 22,000, then another, uh, then getting them down to, to 300. Um, but but this, is, this is what we know, that in these times of testing, God is at work, right? God will never tempt us to do something sinful, but many times God will test us to build faith in our life, to build dependence. And if we're not careful in those times of testing, it is very easy to panic and to sort of uh, take matters in our own hands. That's why Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It is so easy for us in times of testing to say, that doesn't make sense. Cut my armies. That doesn't make sense. I need to go to what I can understand and what I can process. But remember, God's ways are not your way. So when you are tested by God, do not panic. Secondly, don't panic when you perceive that the odds are against you. Can you imagine how Gideon must have felt? Chapter 8 tells us of, about the Midianites that their, that their armies were 135,000 men. Uh, that's, that's 450 Midianites to every one Israeli soldier. And, and God wants Israel to face this amazing army with just 300 men, not only 300 men, but 300 men who don't even drink politely, all right, or, 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 or who drink their water politely like they're lapping it up, right? So we, we got a test that says we're not even taking the, the crudest warriors, we're taking the most polite warriors of the bunch, and that's who we want to fight these, these renegades with. Here's what God did. God created an impossible situation of human weakness, 
in order to exalt his own strength. That's why when the odds are against us, we do not need to panic because the word tells us over and over again that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. In fact, in Luke 18, 27, it tells us that what is impossible with men is possible with God. Gideon was looking at an impossible situation, 300 against 135,000. There is no question they were outmatched. But God is a God of the impossible. And just like for Gideon, when we surrender these opportunities to him, when we do not panic, but we trust him in the midst of these kind of opportunities, we find that God is always faithful. So here's, here's my challenge to you today. Um, I want sometime this week, I want to ask you to just pray a, a simple prayer and do some very simple evaluation in your life. Um, and, and here's two things I want you to ask yourself. Number one, are there areas of your life that you lean too heavily upon yourself for? Maybe, maybe there's some areas that you lean very heavily upon your talents or upon your resources or upon your planning ability. Now, I'm not to say that, that those things are wrong because they're not, but there's certain times when God calls us to act and rather than, and rather than uh, surrendering to what he is calling us to do, we lean in on our own understanding. So we lean in on, on our ability to plan things out. And because we can't make sense of it, it doesn't line up with our plan, we say, that can't be God. Or because it doesn't seem to match, uh, our, our resources doesn't seem to match the need, we say, there's no way that could be God because I can't even afford that. You know what? If you could afford it, you wouldn't need God. Or you say, I'm not, I'm not talented in that area, so there's no way I could do that. Well, maybe God is calling you. Remember, Gideon didn't feel like a mighty warrior. That wasn't the talent that it was upon his life. But God told him, I am with you, mighty warrior. I'm calling you a mighty warrior before you ever see yourself as a mighty warrior. Some of you need to realize that what God is seeing in you is greater than the talents or the abilities that you're seeing within yourself. So what areas in your life are you leaning too heavily upon yourself? And here's the second question. How can we cut down that self-sufficiency and increase our dependence upon God? So how can we say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop allowing myself to make these decisions with an independence from you, and I'm going to learn to make these decisions fully dependent upon you, even if they don't make sense to me, even if I can't understand them. Remember, God created this impossible situation for Gideon so that his own strength could be seen. And, and, and let, let me tell you, that's God's specialty. And that's what God wants to do with us. Why? Because of what 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I know you've heard me say that many times. You've heard it quoted many times. You've got it memorized. Uh, but boy, it is so easy for us to get away from the fact that what's inside of us is greater than any force in this world. God is looking to glorify himself on earth through people who are fully dependent on him, who believe fully he is with them and who are ready to, like Gideon, charge that hill in the name of the Lord. See, God doesn't need a majority vote uh, from us on, on these things. Like, he really doesn't need us at all, does he? But he invites us to join him in doing his will. And when we do, we reap the benefits and God gets the glory. I love the quote that is so often attributed to D.L. Moody, who said, give me 10 men who fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and I 
will change the world. I think we see that in the heart of Gideon in our story today and in next week. We're going to see exactly the end result of this battle. I think you already know it, but we're going to see that that's exactly what happened. God took a minority group of, of people, a small group, a fraction of an army, and literally changed the trajectory of a country with it. So I want to encourage you again to grow in your dependence upon God. Let our self-sufficiency decrease that he might increase. When we feel the odds are against us, let's not panic. Let's just trust him even more, just like Gideon, and we'll see God do miracles in us and through us. 